Well, during a news conference on Sunday, a reporter asked White House physician Sean Connolly about statements made by White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who directly contradicted him the day before. Yesterday, you told us that the president was in great shape, had been in good shape and fever-free for the previous 24 hours. Minutes after your press conference, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows told reporters that the president's vitals were very concerning over the past 24 hours. Simple question for the American people. Whose statements about the president's health should we believe? So, uh, the chief and I work side by side, and uh, I think his statement was misconstrued. What he meant was that uh, 24 hours ago, when uh, he and I were are checking on the president, that there was that momentary episode of the high fever and, and that temporary drop uh, in the saturation, which prompted us to act uh, you know, expediently to move him up here. Fortunately, that was really a very transient, limited episode. Uh, a couple hours later, he was back up uh, mild again. Um, you know, we could, I'm not going to speculate what that, uh, that limited episode was about so early in the course, but uh, he's doing well. It was painful to watch these two news conferences, both on Saturday and Sunday, with the level of evasiveness and misinformation. Dr. Ajit Shah is with us now, dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, previously the director of Harvard University's Global Health Institute. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Dr. Jaw. And I was wondering if you can talk about the significance of what he was not telling the truth about, the osteopath, uh, Dr. Sean Conley. Yeah, so good morning. Thank you for having me on. Um, you know, a lot of the information that came from Dr. Connolly over this weekend was uh, confusing. And I think, in general, he made things much worse than making them better. Um, the evasiveness around information. Uh, Saturday was a disaster as a press conference. Uh, yesterday was a bit better, uh, but, but it was, you know, not that much better. And at this point, most people, I think, in this country are confused about the president's medical condition. Uh, because of both inconsistency and evasiveness, uh, and a sense that we're just not getting the full picture at all. So, what about uh, Dr. Conley, uh, the personal physician for President Trump, uh, saying uh, he was just trying to be upbeat, so he didn't want to tell the truth about getting oxygen and what it means to get oxygen, why this is so significant? And go back to uh, Thursday night. Friday morning, 1 in the morning, uh, Eastern time, it's announced that President Trump announces he and the First Lady have tested positive for COVID. And very soon after, he is going into—he has serious symptoms, which suggest that he did not just turn positive that night. That's right. So, look, the natural course of this disease, of course, varies from person to person. But typically, what we see is after somebody's infected, uh, three to five days later, uh, they might turn positive, and a couple of days later, they develop symptoms, which they're going to go on to develop symptoms. And so, uh, this is, again, the timeline here is very confusing. And when Dr. Connolly on Saturday said it had been 72 hours, that puts them back to Wednesday as a day of diagnosis. So, there's been a lot of clarification, a lot of back and forth. At this point, I think we think he turned positive for the first time on Thursday uh, and then had symptoms on Friday. But but instead of guesswork, it'd be helpful if the White House just came forward and gave us the, the basic data and facts. And I think that would be very helpful. And, of course, we have no idea when he turned positive, because they won't say when he last took a test before Thursday. Now it looks like on Tuesday, uh, the Fox moderator, Chris Wallace, said, you know, as I just was saying to Jeff Mason, that Trump came too late to take a test. And uh, reporters have reported that both on Wednesday and Thursday, when he flew to New Jersey for his fundraiser, that he was not looking good. He was tired. His voice was hoarse. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, presidents have difficult schedules. They can get tired. Their voices can get hoarse. So we don't know if those were symptoms of COVID. I mean, I've, obviously, in retrospect, it sure is concerning that that is the case. Um, you know, one of the things that people bring up is that in a situation like this, um, again, he is a president. He's allowed, obviously, some amount of privacy, but he is the president. And, and, there, and, and transparency is incredibly important to assure the American people. All of this speculation and guesswork and kind of trying to read between the lines could be made to go away if the White House just released basic information about his testing history, about his symptom history, about his therapy history, 
uh, it, this, none of this stuff would be difficult to pull together. I bet somebody could do it in about an hour. And we could put all the speculation to rest. And the fact that the White House is not doing that, is creating a lot more speculation and unease and guesswork and actually just frank out rumor mongering uh, than, than what would happen if they just came out and told us what was happening. Let's talk about what President Trump is getting right now. The only uh, person we know that has gotten this combination of drugs, the experimental, investigational, Regeneron uh, cocktail, if you could explain what that is, immune-enhancing, then remdesivir and dexamethasone, which is extremely serious, not usually given to anyone uh, but critically ill COVID patients, since he's gotten one after another of these. Uh, what they are, first of all, Dr. Ja, and also, is this because he's president of the United States and they're just hitting him with everything at once, because they have access to it and they can? Or is it because he is critically ill? Yeah, so let's talk about the three therapies, and then let's talk about his particular treatment course. The three therapies, the, the experimental Regeneron monoclonal antibodies. Um, antibodies, people understand, these are proteins that are made against uh, viruses, against bacteria. And what we've done is, uh, Regeneron and other companies have done, is created uh, in the lab synthetic antibodies against the spike protein of the virus. Uh, and there's good reason to believe that that's going to be a useful therapeutic. Uh, it's undergoing clinical studies. We don't know if it works or not, but again, a lot of us are hopeful. But hope is not evidence. It's just we're hopeful. About 260 and, people have taken this, right? Yeah, and and uh, and it seems on that preliminary data to may have been helpful, but we haven't even seen the the full data from that, those 260 people yet. Uh, we've seen a press release. And we need a lot more, uh, a lot more data on on what has happened. But either way, it's not unreasonable to give the president this experimental therapy. There are people who are getting it, and sometimes we do these things. Uh, remdesivir is an antiviral. It actually uh, blocks the replication of the virus, and it has had some evidence of efficacy uh, for this specific virus. Uh, dexamethasone, of course, is a steroid, and you use the steroid. The, the steroid is actually an immunosuppressant. And we tend to use the steroid uh, for this disease in kind of later phases, because what we think is that there are two phases of this disease. There are the vi there's the viral phase where the virus replicates and people get quite—some uh, people get sick. And then there's kind of an immunologic phase where the immune system overreacts. And so to deal with that second phase is when you use dexamethasone, it's very rare to use— all of this stuff together in one kind of over a two-day period. It is unusual. I do have a little bit of a feel. Look, I don't have his clinical record in front of me. I generally don't like to second-guess other physicians. He's got excellent doctors working for him and taking care of him. Um, but it is a bit unusual to have all of this stuff happening the way it is. And it certainly makes us worried that he is getting what we often talk about as VIP care, uh, which is often worse care, because with VIPs, uh, we tend to often throw out the kind of scientific guidebook and go and start improvising, uh, because we want to do everything for them. But that's not necessarily better care. It can mean uh, overdoing things. Again, I, I don't have enough details about his clinical condition to know whether he's getting the right care, uh, but certainly this is concerning. And the dexamethasone, uh, which is a steroid antisuppressant, it's dangerous to give it too early to a COVID patient. Is that right? Absolutely. So, again, we've got one really high-quality clinical trial on this, and it showed that people who got it early, people who got it when there was no respiratory compromise, actually did worse. And that's probably because they were in that, virology, that sort of virologic phase where their immune system was actually uh, necessary, and it was not overreacting. And if you give dexamethasone too early, you can do more harm than good. Uh, again, with the president, I'm, you know, I trust the physicians, the experts at, Doc, uh, at Walter Reed and Hopkins were involved. So I'm assuming they're making good decisions, but but it's really hard to know with all the opacity of what exactly is happening with it. So, Dr. Ajish Shah, let's talk about what happened on Thursday. Um, whether or not President Trump knew, I mean, I just with the number of lies that spew from the White House and from the president himself, whether he knew he was positive when he took off to fly to New Jersey. He clearly knew. I mean, his uh, the White House spokespeople have said, uh, Mark Meadows has said, he knew before he took off 
that Hope Hicks had tested positive, and he is with her constantly. And they were on the flight together, Air Force One, when she was feeling sick the night before. He knew this. Talk about the dangers that he put people in on that flight, and then when he arrived in New Jersey, the people at Bedminster, his donors, did not know about these circumstances before. Um, apparently, the White House has refused to turn over the list to the New Jersey governor so that they can do contact tracing. Hundreds of people were there for an inside-outside event. Talk about this. Yeah. So, the CDC guidelines on this is very clear, and for good reason. Uh, the evidence here is very clear. So, um, let's assume that he had not gotten tested uh, positive on Thursday morning when he took off for Bedminster. If he had been, if he knew that Ms. Hicks was positive, he at that point was a contact. He was somebody who needed to quarantine for 14 days, uh, irrespective of any positive or negative test. The reason is because he was he had some significant risk of having been infected and in fact having become infectious so the idea that once you know you're a contact you get on a plane and you go to a fundraiser is deeply irresponsible now people keep thinking of this as somehow these quarantines and these isolations are nice to have would be nice to do no this is essential work uh, you know i i was thinking about the fact that I mean, we People are missing work. People are missing school because of quarantining. Uh, when we have to quarantine, it poses a huge burden on everybody. But you have to do it because that's how you break chains of transmission for this highly infectious virus. And it applies to everyone. The president is not immune from this virus, as we know. And the president is also not immune from spreading the virus. So the idea that he knew he was a contact to somebody who was positive, and knew, should have known, everybody around him should have known, that he needed to quarantine for 14 days, and yet still went to an event, I think is, as I said, it's deeply irresponsible, is disrespectful to everybody he came in close contact with, because he was essentially saying uh, that I could be transmitting the virus to you, and it doesn't matter. Um, and, 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 it, you know, and it also undermines our ability to ask other Americans to do this, because if the president won't do it for a fundraiser, how do we ask a child to do it for, uh, to avoid school? How do we ask an essential worker to miss days of work and do this? Um, I don't understand it, to be perfectly honest, and I find it uh, upsetting, frustrating. It just it's it's irresponsible. And uh, one of the people who uh, President Trump met with there had just recently lost their father to COVID. This is not to mention the number of workers at Bedminster, um, at his private golf club, um, that are exposed, not to mention what's happening at the White House right now. And we won't even know how many or who have tested positive, because the press secretary says she will not reveal this anymore. Michael Shear of The New York Times, who's tested positive, who covers the White House, said he hasn't been contacted by the White House. Um, the significance of contact tracing, Dr. Shah, and what this means all over, the message President Trump sends not wearing a mask, his own um, uh, surrogates, people like Jason Miller, people uh, who work with him, once again, even as Trump was in the hospital, mocked Joe Biden for wearing a mask. Yeah, so let's go back to contact tracing. Again, contact tracing is not a nice thing to have. It gives you information. No, 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 no. It's essential to stopping the outbreak. There is an outbreak happening at the White House. It will continue to spread. It will not go away on its own. It will not magically disappear. It will continue to spread within the White House. It will spread to other people outside the White House. That's how the virus works. The way you stop it is you test, trace, and isolate. You test people, you identify who's been infected, you uh, isolate uh, folks who are infected, and you quarantine all their contacts. And you keep going until you've got the virus under control. And it really feels like the White House is seeing this as an inconvenience. Uh, it's sure it's an inconvenience. It's also essential. And the other part, to me, as a, as a citizen, is you know, we all pay, the, through our taxes, we pay for the people who work at the White House. We uh, absolutely have a right to know what's happening. I don't need to know people's personal information, uh, but we absolutely know need to know who's been tested, who's been infected, uh, who's quarantined. Uh, that is a basic right of Americans to understand about their government. 
Uh, so you can't, I don't believe it's, it's at all reasonable that that information would somehow be kept. But again, I want to emphasize there's a lot of political leaders on both sides of the political aisle, but certainly this White House, that have taken things like quarantining and testing and tracing as nice things to do if you can do it, if you can get around to it. And I want to emphasize that's actually the only real tool we have for stopping the chains of transmission and bringing the virus under control. Doing anything else is irresponsible. We are at 210,000 people in this country who have died. Um, set more than 7 million have been infected. Um, can you talk about, as we wrap up right now, the most egregious mistakes of this administration that President Trump seems to continue, be continuing even as he is sick with COVID? Yeah, so when you look at other countries that have done a much, much better job, there is one thing that differentiates them from us, and that is about taking the virus seriously. Um, there isn't one formula. You could do masking. You could do testing and tracing. You could do uh, really aggressive social distancing or some combination of all three of those things. What has happened is that our federal government, at every step, has downplayed the virus, has minimized its impact, has uh, it's led the American people to believe that somehow it's about to go away. And that has undermined every effort that it has made and has undermined every effort of state and, and local governments and individuals. It has created confusion. It has uh, spread misinformation. Really, there's one thing. This is a very serious virus. Let's take it seriously. Let's do the things that we know to bring it under control. And we can. And if we do, we can open up schools and we can open up workplaces. We can get a lot of our lives back, but only if we control the virus. And the failure to control the virus will go down as, I think, one of the biggest catastrophes of American uh, domestic and health policy in generations. And it continues to baffle me that we still aren't doing it. Uh, Dr. Ajish Shah, I want to thank you for being with us now, Dean of Brown University School of Public Health. And I want to thank Jeff Mason, Reuters White House correspondent. Um, instead of the question, what did the president know and when did he know it? When was the president infected and who did he infect? As we continue to cover the infection election. When we come back, Kentucky's attorney general has complied with a judge's order to release 15 hours of audio tape from the disputed grand jury proceedings. We'll speak with uh, the family attorney uh, for Breonna Taylor, Ben Crump. Stay with us.